you. I, for those of y'all, if it bores you silly, but I'm trying to bring out points in here because I love the historical factor of Samuel, but I love how the, if, if you look at it and dig down into um, First and Second Samuel, there's so many lessons to be learned and things that if you, I do think as you look at it, you start seeing how God's hand moves, how God, it can be against you, for you. It's according to how you're walking with the Lord. Now, um, this, in First Samuel, this is right after you come out of Judges where God is raising up people. He just raises them up. And that's how he choose, chose leadership, was he would just raise up someone. So he has raised up Samuel at this moment. Now, a shift is about to take place here in the 8th chapter. Samuel was, as we went through Samuel's story, uh, he was raised up. He was uh, what they would call the, the seer, what we'll see a little bit later in the ninth chapter. Uh, the seers were called the prophets of the day, um, but he was known as the leader of Israel. And as you walk through First Samuel, you'll see the transitions in leadership. And, and I always loved it. And if you had a, uh, something written about you or myself, and you had to write it at the beginning like they did at most of these, whether you walk with the Lord or not. They did that to kings. But Samuel was a man that was aligned with God. He walked with God. In the 8th chapter, you'll see that when it gives you this, it says, Samuel grew old and appointed his sons as judges of Israel. The name of his first one was, born was Joel. The other, uh, second born was Abijai. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, accepted bribes, and perverted justice. Now, I will tell you this. God hates that. Um, he hates the scales of justice being out of balance. And so as you start looking throughout scriptures and you see the things that are going on in scriptures, you'll find that uh, well, even when Solomon's writing about this later, and you see in Proverbs, the balance of things, and, and that's the side of me, um, when you start looking at giftings, that prophetic gifting, there's a, there's not a lot of gray area for the prophetic gifting. It's just there's a right, there's a wrong. I cannot stand when I start looking at the injustices in our political system. Um, that's why I do get criticism at times. They said, preacher, you need to leave politics out of the pulpit. I don't believe that. I, of course, I don't tell anybody how to vote. I will speak against both parties at times because I think they both lack backbones and, and whatever. There's some lacking in both parties. And, and in politics, when people start just playing politics and then they tell you to leave the religion out, I say, as a preacher, they need to get some religion in their politics so they can get their balance back and they can have the justice back. Um, because I, don't, I do not like what I see on the horizon coming even for America I don't like the things that, um, because I look at the Old Testament and I watch Israel's fate and I see what happened in Israel's day. When they walked after the Lord, God blessed them. There was things that uh, they, they would win victories and battles. There was things that would take place. When they left that, it always, God was in opposition. Uh, God opposes the proud, those who choose to do it their way, but he gives grace to the humble those who choose to do it God's way. So I look at this and I say, if we could learn anything valuable about this, even this political system that we have, um, we elect leaders is kind of where they're going to at this point in the, in the eighth chapter. They get to a point where they see Samuel's getting old. And as he's getting as old, they said his sons are not judging properly. And they start seeing the injustices they're doing. And, and, and there's nothing worse than when you go before a judge, and it's even now in, in America that you see that I think they arrested a pro-life guy the other day. The FBI banged on the door, came in with rifles and stuff. They had gone into an abortion clinic and were singing hymns. That's it. And now the FBI, it's been back, I think back in April when that happened, the FBI gets a warrant for their arrest. The man's a father of 11 children. And uh, you can look this up. They've had it on several of the talk shows. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a husband of 11 children. No threats whatsoever given out in any way. But because they were in there singing hymns, 
to try to intervene against abortion, uh, and it's so federally protected, um, they sent the FBI to knock on his door, would not tell them what they were doing or anything else. That just looks corrupt. The wife is filming the whole time, and he's like, who are you? What are you doing? They came and put him in handcuffs, took him off, um, and they've arrested another 80-something-year-old lady. I think she's a 70-something-year-old lady that was at that protest that day. She was actually a survivor of some of Hitler's, Hitler's death camps, and uh, they arrested her. And you find that there were several of them that were arrested in that, but that's where you see injustice. Because as we all watched last summer, and I don't want to be on a bandwagon here, but we all watched last summer, the summer in 2020, uh, when they were burning down federal courthouses over there in Seattle. Didn't want any federal help whatsoever. But they, they just said, we're going, we could burn this down. You could burn down whatever you want, whatever business you want. And that was just a part of the protest. And I'm sitting there going, you know, um, there's an injustice here singing hymns in an abortion clinic. Were they trespassing at that point? Yes, but if they leave peaceably and they didn't get arrested that day and now an arrest warrant went out for them. There's an injustice, and justice is not being served properly. Some of the folks on January 6th, I do not say that was right. You go in the Capitol like they did, they shouldn't have done that. I'll go ahead and say that. That was trespassing. Um, but the injustice of putting them in jail and uh, some of them haven't had a hearing yet, and they've just been in jail, and um, they're going to get 11 to 15 years, something like that, um, for just basically trespassing. And uh, was it foolish? Was it wrong? Yeah. But then I look at all the protests that happened, and, I mean, people lost their lives. There was things that it's just not right. So when you start, the reason I find the Old Testament so valuable is that I look at it and I go, when you see the people and their hearts go astray from God, the nation, it starts having the repercussions of that. I believe, personally, and, I, and I'll say this, I know it's a political season, we have the scales that are unjust right now, and those scales that are happening, um, God judges an in unjust situation. He will judge that. Our nation, you cannot kill the millions and millions of babies. Now, I say this as a caveat every time. If anybody's had an abortion, there's forgiveness in that. But it was wrong. And I've got to say it because that, to me, one wrong doesn't make two rights. I mean, two wrongs don't make one right. And I find that we as a nation, because they're saying everything's going to vote on this Roe v. Wade should have never been, it was never in the Constitution, never should have been even interpreted that way. It was bad law to start with. And now it finally got turned back to the states. And uh, I find it to be very um, uncomfortable as you see um, if, if the deception that goes on behind a lot of this. Um, Gog and Magog in the Old Testament, if you look at that, it was a sacrifice of babies that were required. Um, I remember one guy preaching that. I think it was Rick Pinto or something. He used to be the big leader of the anti-abortion movement in Birmingham. And it's talking about Vulcan being like the god of Molech and uh, all the abortion clinics there on the south side. And he said, it's just there's something spiritual about all this. So I say all that in that when we as a nation turn our hearts against God um, and his ways, Israel found out the hard way that you're going to face repercussions from that. Um, they did. They kept, they, it was a revolving door of repercussions. Um, but here's where they start. A shift starts taking place because they come to Samuel. They're not excited about Samuel's sons because they weren't following after God. And that's why I said when I opened up, how would you like your life to be printed? And it first come out and say, well, John didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. You know, it's like, well, well that's not fair. You know, but it's, you know, what you see of this, because anytime the kings, when you get over to the kings and they start, 
he walked in the ways of David or he walked in the ways of, you know, it's like, goodness gracious, you know, it tells you right up front whether they did right or wrong or did it with a whole heart or not a whole heart. Uh, and so Samuel, he walked with God. His sons did not. Um, that's something that's, that's a preacher dilemma, I guess. But anyway, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel Ramah. They said to him, you're old, your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. Now, here's the problem. God wanted to raise up leadership. And the way he was doing it in Judges, when the need arose, he would raise somebody up, whether it be Deborah or be Gideon, whether it uh, be Balak. I think it was Balak. There were other judges, and, and you'll find that Samson, God would raise up and deliver because their hearts went astray, and he had to raise somebody up and deliver them. He was going to provide the leadership. God was. But instead, they said, give us a king as the other nations have. You know, anybody's got anything you want to throw in on this or thoughts that you've heard over the years is fine. They said, give us a king to lead us. This displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, and it's not you they're rejecting, but they're rejecting me as their king. Why is that important? Because our, our hope is never to be put in a person, necessarily. One of the, the faults that I see in America, and especially in the conservative ranks, li the liberals that are on the far left, and they're progressives, what we call them, they don't quit. I mean, they could, you could put Hitler in office, and they will not quit. They'll keep to, to better Hitler, you know. They'll keep going. Conservatives, we get close enough and go, good, oh, ha, we're done, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's just you just kind of quit. You sit back and you go, well, my job's done now, you know. And, and really it's not. We found that, you know, if any of y'all love paying the $5 a gallon for gas, I don't. Um, and I don't think you can get away from fossil fuels, but that's just me and my opinion. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to resist a golf cart for the rest of my life, I think, I hope. And uh, I, me and Hugh put us in that thing that uh, Mary drives. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I don't know what that vehicle is. It's a smart vehicle, though, but I, it's a golf cart with a top on it. And she loves it, which is fine. But I can't imagine. I, somebody gave a church a... Toyota, I can't remember which family did, gave us a, gave us something. I got it back running. We were going to sell it as a church. I remember driving it over the hill. I forget how, it was a small, small car. And I was sitting at a red light, I think down there on Caldwell Mill and in Valleydale. And I looked up to the handle on the SUV next to me. <laughs> and I was like, this is the most uncomfortable I've been in quite some time. Because I mean, whatever, I can't, I can't remember what kind of car it was, but it was like a, almost, I think maybe it wasn't a convertible, but it was a tiny car and it was a four speed i wanted to drive it so i was driving it and i looked up at that handle i was going mm -mm, i don't like this being down here so uh, you, you you got to get that can open to get you out if something happened but i i know this that in this political environment we are right now the world is turning more and more away from god there is there's more danger on the horizon in this nation than what i think we're paying attention to uh, there are things that are happening in the uh, that we're 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 going to see a um, the dollar collapse is what a lot of people are working towards is for the dollar to collapse and therefore you go to the um, the non what is that called cryptocurrency everything will be just imaginary money at this point and then it can be controlled because the other day the alarming yeah I got in my imagination I'm I am rich you know but. It's not based on anything. And then you find, I think, too, what we're seeing is not only that, this, this world, we're, we're turning so fast to what we see in Revelation. I don't know you guys, where are you on Revelation? Okay. When you start getting towards the end there, you start looking at things that are unfolding. You start looking at Daniel. I know Sherilyn went through Daniel. And I, I just know that as I look at what's happening to get rid of the dollar to the vulnerability of Israel as a nation, you start seeing 
more and more things that are lining up and using the climate hoax. And I say that endearingly. I do think litter bothers me more than it did when I was a kid. You know, you remember when, I don't know, some of you older, how did you used to empty your cars out going down the road at 65? <laughs> Just throw it on the side of the road. And then that Indian sitting there crying, that always bothered me. That was the best commercial. They have that Native American guy with a tear rolling down his face in the garbage. That is the best commercial of all. As you're going, oh, man, we just trashed their nation just because they threw garbage out. And so it kind of stopped me from doing it. But you find that, and if, the funny thing was, we would never litter. But if you put all your trash in back of the truck, in the pickup truck, you know, you just kind of throw your McDonald's bag back there, and it's gone when you get to the job site. We didn't throw it out on the road. It just blows up. Anyway, I say all that is we, we're finding now I think our nation is in peril. We're trying desperately, I believe. I'm hoping that there will be a pendulum swing this election because I, I see the green climate things. I, I, don't, I start out and say, I don't like litter and don't want, I try to recycle as much as I can, all that, because I do feel there's responsibility in that. But what we're trying to do with windmills and, and for, <laughs> for all places, for Texas to have a blackout and they sit on one of the largest oil reserves in the world and for them to have a blackout because the windmills wouldn't roll, that's a problem, you know? I mean, that's something wrong with this picture. And so I don't know. I feel like we're we're living in a upside down opposite day world, and and we're all kind of sitting back. That's why I say, be proactive. I'm not telling you who to vote for. Vote, 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 vote. Be proactive though. I know in Alabama we're we're pretty much a Republican state, but be proactive, and uh, that does make a difference. I mean the the small amount of votes that that changed it last time. Um, whether you thought it was legal or not, I don't know. Let me get back to scriptures. I got off so far. I'll wander back in here. They said, give us this king. And the Lord said, listen to them. The people are saying to you, they have not rejected you, they rejected me. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaken me and serving other gods. But so they are doing it to you. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that what the king who will reign over them will do. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king will reign over you. He goes through this long thing. He says, he's going he's to draft your kids. He's going to put them out there at war. He's going to tax you. He's going to have all these things are going to happen to you. And he says, he's going to take a tenth of your flocks, yourselves to become his slaves. With that, the day will come. You'll cry out for relief and the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. Pretty strong. Now, another little tangent. Anybody that thinks the government can do a better job than an individual, it ain't going to work. If they can take money from you and go, I know how to distribute this, I will take that church elder or that church deacon and put them in charge. They can make that money go a lot further than a bureaucrat in Washington. I'm, I'm, even a Red Cross, I, I've even... I hesitant to give to Red Cross. I'm just hesitant. Salvation Army is a little better, or I try to keep it local as I can because the bureaucracy is so big, and you got to feed the bureaucracy. And I know the Red Cross done long-term stuff they're good at. They can take care of things. But even then, I sit there and say the bureaucracy, if I can find a local church, I know they will stretch those dollars to make them work. And I've seen it too many times in disasters, like the God's Kitchen down there on the coast when that big hurricane went through Gulfport. Uh, that was all local. There was a lot of things and people pouring a lot of money into the local economy. To me, that's, a, that's so much better. I don't have to pay for 14 executives in Washington somewhere before you can get a hamburger down there in Louisiana. So I don't know. I got different views on stuff. You might question it, but that's me. But he goes on to tell me, he said, this is what all is going to happen to you. He's going to do all this to you. But there were people few refused to listen to Samuel. No, we want a king over us. Even after he told them all the bad things is going to happen, all the things. 
Government is never going to, when the government says we are your friend, we are here to help, you are in trouble. We want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us, to go out before us, to fight our battles. A king don't have to fight battles. Your sons have to fight battles. And, I, and I've got draft age kids, and uh, I will take somebody that's not saying, hey, let's go over here and fight these people with war and try to clean this up. Uh, I kind of look at the Ukraine, and I'm going, whoo, you know, all the corruption was over there, the billions of dollars have been spent over there, and we're dropping more money, more stuff, and I'm going, hmm, just hope we don't get pulled into that one. Well, that's not going to be pretty, you know, any way you look at it. And so when it comes to politicians, um, and honestly, I voted against one of our governor, uh, people running for governor, because he has made his millions off the military uh, stuff, even though he's a good guy. But he made his millions or billions off of the military. You got to be at war in order to make that military thing go. <laughs> and so I'm going, uh, if you're going to prosper, I'm going, let's hold up a little bit. Nothing wrong with the military. Love the military. But the politicians that get in charge of it, I'm scared of. Anyway. He's heard all this. People said he repeated before the Lord. The Lord answered him, listened to them, give it to him. And Samuel said to all the men of Israel, everyone go back to your own town. There was a Benjamite who was standing, uh, standing, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeor, son of, uh, we'll stop. <laughs> he had a son named Saul. I can't get through all the names. An impressive young man with that, out an equal among the Israelites, head taller than all the others. His donkeys belonging to his father, Kish, was lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of your servants and with you and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hills, the country of Ephraim. He goes through a bunch of places, okay? He gets in, he passed through territory. But Benjamin did not find him. Then he reached out to the district of Zuth, and Saul said to the servant who was with him, come, let's go back to my father. We'll stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, look, in this town, there's a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything says comes true. Let's go there. Perhaps he will tell you what, what way to take. Saul said to the servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift. Take the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered, look, he said, I have a quarter shekel of silver, and I'll give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, come, let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called the seer. So it gives you a little explanation what they're doing. Hear me on this. Saul was what God, there was a leading here. Now, there's a lot of twists and turns that are going to happen in between the time Saul becomes king, time he loses his kingship, time David becomes king. Saul was appointed. Now, he, the part I want you to see is he was looking for donkeys, and you're going to find out he ends up being king. All right? Don't take any of your natural day-to-day -day things for granted. God can use them. God can direct you. He's taking these donkeys, not able to find them. They suddenly say, let's go to this prophet. Maybe he can tell us which way to turn. And he said, so he said, come, let's go. They were going out to town where the man of God was. As they were going up to the hill, town, hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw some water. They asked him, is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He has just come to our town today, for the people have sacrificed at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes. He must, be, must bless the sacrifice afterwards. Those who are invited to eat, go up now. You will find him about this time. Can you see God's orchestrating some things? He's got this guy, Saul, out looking for donkeys over here. Not in this town, not in this town, not in this town. Not. Saul, circuit riding prophet, I mean Samuel, circuit riding prophet, he's rolling around doing the sacrifices all these places because that's his job. I call him circuit riding preacher. These two things are about to intercept. God's orchestrating. Now, see it. This is the Old Testament, but see it this way. God orchestrates things each day. 
He puts you in these places, and you got to see your life. And sometimes, understand, Saul was frustrated. He's been looking for these donkeys. He's almost given up. He's like, man, I, my dad's going to start worrying about us because we've been gone so long. Poof, idea, let's go see the prophet. Hey, the prophet just happened to be at this town where we haven't looked. Let's go find the prophet. All this is coming together. God's orchestrated it. So before Saul came to the Lord, he revealed, uh, before the day before Saul came to the Lord, the Lord revealed to Samuel, about this time tomorrow, I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Who would have thought a bunch of donkeys being lost, you'd end up being here. Now, before you think everything's happened chance in your life, understand God is directing us. I want you to see that. That's the, the important lessons in all this that I see. And, and so God's directing. He said, he would come to the land of Benjamin. Anoint him as leader over my people of Israel. He would deliver my people from the hand of Philistines. I have looked upon my people and their cry has reached me. In other words, God's relenting. He said, okay, you want a king? I got this guy out here as lost as a goose in a windstorm looking for donkeys. He's going to be the man. Samuel caught the sight of, of Saul. The Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel on the gateway and asked, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me in the high place today, and you are to eat with me. And in the morning, I'll let you go and tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They have been found. And to whom to all desire of Israel turn, if not, if not to you and all your father's family. Saul answered, but I am not a Benjamite from the small, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel and not my clan, the least of all the clans and tribes of Benjamin? Why would you say a such thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul as a servant, Paul, and seated him at the head of the table. He was invited about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring a piece of meat I gave you and the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took the leg with, <laughs> with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. In other words, he got the big old John Madden turkey. You know, John Madden always on Thanksgiving when he was doing the NFL. I mean, there was turkey legs coming off turkey legs, you know. I think it was about 15 turkey legs on that turkey. He loved turkey legs. And it, it's always, I always remember that because it was like, it just was weird having all those legs hanging on that thing. But they made that just for John Madden. So the cook took up the leg and set it in front of him. And Samuel said, here's what has been kept for you. Eat because it was set aside for you on this occasion from the time I said I invited the guest. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. They came down from the high place to the town. Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called Saul to the roof. Get ready. I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while, and I, that I may give you a message from God. Pretty good. Now, years ago in the church, and I don't see it as much. There's a few that I'm seeing around still. There was a prophetic movement. And, I mean, there were prophets everywhere, just about. You, you couldn't throw a rock without seeing a prophet. We had a lady, Diane Palmer. She came to the church, invited her to come. I think it was a Sunday night. The elders allowed her to come. And I asked the elders, I said, it could be controversial because people don't understand the prophetic ministry. But Diane Palmer came. She was legit. I mean, she could, you know, it's like Mike Wilkinson. I, I'll share his testimony because I asked Mike because she gave him a word that night. And uh, I said, Mike was, how, was, how close was he? He said, well, unless you stand in my bathroom, look at my bathroom cabinet on the medicines I was on, she wouldn't have known any of that, you know. So she was so accurate, it was unreal. And, uh, but, I mean, she had a ministry that we had a guy to come play the piano, and she'd, he'd play, I think Kyle did at that time. He'd play music, and she'd sing some, and then give prophetic words out. It could be strange to some people, but I look at it as God's using it. And in that day, when everybody was looking for a word from the Lord, Saul was not looking for that. He was just looking for donkeys. And God surprised him with a word. Now, there's a lesson to learn there. Because too many times when they had that prophetic movement that was happening, because there was even a school of prophets down in Pensacola. And uh, you'd go down there in the school of prophets, and you could learn uh, the proper ways of doing things, which was okay, because we had a lot of prophets that I think were out of order. I was around a couple guys that were totally out of order. Um, but 
you find, because you can use a prophetic ministry and it can become a manipulative tool if you don't watch it, if you don't keep your heart before the Lord. It becomes a manipulative tool. And I saw guys use it that way. And uh, I saw guys to miss the words. I remember one girl, she came down for a word at the, upon this rock where I was. And, and as a prophet, and you're giving out prophetic words, and Samuel did okay with here with Saul because there was them one-on-one with them. But I can remember that prophetic words. I think in the body of Christ, those words need to be judged by leadership also. Okay? If you're going to give a prophetic words, it needs to be judged by somebody in leadership to make sure it's good. Because I remember this one guy, and he was legitimate. I know him. Uh, but he gave a word to this one girl. And I can remember uh, she left crying. I don't know what he said because it was whispered to her. And I stopped her at the door to try to talk to her and say, hey, let's go back and get some clarity. You know, I'll go with you. Because I was kind of part of leadership, but not official, but unofficial. And I said, I'll go back. But she was upset pretty bad. I don't know what he spoke to her. Whether it was a rebuke or something. I don't know. A lot of times the prophetic words are not that in this day and time. But sometimes they are. Here's Saul and Samuel sitting there talking. He's about to give him a word. When you're looking for donkeys, you're liable to get a word. And Samuel took a flask of oil and pulled it on his head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over your inheritance? Meaning, leader over his inheritance, leader over his people. If you go down, you'll find in uh, some of the, the, there's more to this. It says, you will reign over the Lord's people and save them from the power of the enemies round about. And this will be a sign to you, and the Lord has anointed you as leader over his inheritance. That is the long version of that. Um, And it says, when you leave me today, you will meet two men, Rachel's tomb and Zelah, the border of Benjamin. They will, they will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you'll go from there and reach the great tree of Tabor. Now, three men going up to God at Bethel, which was the house of God, will meet you there. One will be carrying three goats, the other one will have loaves of bread, and the other one a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, and when you accept it, accept from them, and you will accept it from them. After that, you will go to the Gilbel, Gibel, Gibel, sorry, thank you, of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high places with lyres, timberland, tim- tambourines, flutes, and harps, and being played before them, and they'll be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and the power and you will be prophesying with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do for the Lord, the God, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and surely I'll come down to be the sacrifice, burnt offerings, and fellowship offerings. You must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Now, he just told him, he said, there's a lot here. I hope he's taking notes. You came looking for donkeys, here's your word. You're going to go here. These guys are going to have this loaves. They're going to have these goats. They're going to give you this. You take this from them. But then you're going to find these prophets that are coming down. And understand, they would get into the presence of God and they would experience things. Now, when you have the prophetic anointing in the church, um, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around on this. When that prophetic anointing is in the church, a lot of times it comes through worship. It comes through, that's why I don't, I, I would say, Anytime we're singing songs, don't just take it as singing songs. God wants to speak to us. All right? I jump to the New Testament. <coughs> songs, hymns, we're singing these things. God wants to speak words to us, just like he did with Samuel and Saul. Samuel spoke to Saul and said, here's what's going to happen to you. Why was this important? The donkeys have been found. That's not the problem now. God has found you, Saul. And Saul tried to argue with him. He said, I'm the least of the least. My tribe's the worst of the worst, but here I am, okay? As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all the signs were fulfilled that day. Those two things that stick out to me, it says, you will prophesy, and you will be a changed into a different person. It'll happen. When you hear a word from God, it changes you. All right, again, I'm going to leave this for a second. 
Ask God for a word on situations. Pray. Seek. Give me a word, Lord. Now, you may be out looking for your donkeys one day, and God speaks to you. And it may be through something you might not even thinking. I mean, he wasn't really, he was just looking for the seer, didn't even know who Samuel was. He was just looking for this guy that could tell him where his donkeys were. <coughs> and instead, his whole life's turned upside down. He was a changed man. The prophecy says, you're going to get with these prophets, and you're going to prophesy. You're going to get into their thing, and you're going to be singing, and you're going to be dancing, and you're going to be prophesying. Which, for a guy who had, and you'll find later, and we'll talk more about Saul, I think he had an inferiority complex. He thought of himself a lot less than he should have. He was taller than anybody else, but he really probably hunched over a little bit, in my opinion, because he didn't see himself. You know, have you ever seen that? Um, nowadays, it's not as much. I mean, when we were growing up, if a girl was 5'10", 5'11", she'd slump more. But she didn't want. Nowadays, they're top models, you know what I mean? But they wouldn't. They don't want to be that tall because everybody would say, "Boy, you are tall. You're tall." And I remember the worst thing, the worst picture I remember is junior high, seventh grade, when Mike and Carolyn were class favorites. Mike was five foot five, and Carolyn was five foot eleven. And they made Mike stand on the bench outside in front of the school, and Carolyn stood beside him so they'd be the same height. Then they took a full body picture <laughs> and put it in there. Poor Mike. I mean, you saw Mike standing on here, and then Carolyn's this tall, and Mike's just kind of standing. They took a full, I'm like, don't do that. Make it look like it was, uh, what's his name, Lad and Shane, because they had to put him on something every time when he was with that. He had to have women that were 5'5", five five, and because he was like 5'5", five five, and uh, they would never show him, you know, put him in heels or whatever. Anyway, he was taller than everybody else, but he needed this word. He said, God's going to change you today. He said, as they said, when they arrived at Gibel, Gibba, he said, I put an L in there, I shouldn't. A pro procession of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him in power. He joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? He said, Is Saul among the prophets? Man, this was a notable thing for a guy that had kind of a low self esteem. Look, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't one, and you're going to find him just in this next little passage right here. He's one hiding in the bushes, hiding behind the crates. Even after Samuel had told him all these things, that you're going to be king, I'm going to anoint you, all these things. And he said, the power of God sat on him, and he said, it changed him that day. A man lived here, answered, he said, and who is their father? Who is his father? Who is their father? And so it came saying, it's Saul among the prophets. After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servants, where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. I love the donkey story. But when he saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, he assured me that the donkeys had been found. He did not tell his uncle what Samuel said about his kingship. Now, you come to whatever conclusion you want. I don't think he believes it yet. I don't think he believes he's worthy yet. I don't think he, I mean, you find there's a lot of things you can probably conjecture in this, but he didn't want to say anything about it. Now, I know the feeling because when God called me in the ministry, I told nobody not to say anything in case I need to back out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of good that did. So he didn't, uh, didn't say anything. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord and Mizpah and said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt, and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have rejected your God, saved you out of all your calamities and distresses. And now, and you have said, no, set a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord and your tribes and clans. When Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was, cho was chosen, then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, the clan of uh, Marta's clan was chosen. Finally, Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But they looked for him. He was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man of God come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. So God had to find him even when he had been anointed. After he had already had an experience with God, he was still having his doubt. They ran and brought him out, and he stood among his people, and he was a head taller than any other's. 
It says, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the regulations of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to their own home. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some troublemaker said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. I'm going to stop there for tonight because it goes into he saves a city here, and that's where he starts bolstering his kingship. But he doesn't last long. What I want you to draw away from tonight, don't take the mundane as just the mundane. God can use that. Understand he can get a word to us in the mundane. You know, one of the reasons I used to, there were parts of it I loved doing in sheetrock. I, when I'd be by myself in those houses and I'm working, not when I had the heathens with me all the time, but, uh, I mean, there were some heathens I had. And you couldn't keep your mind on a lot of things because they talk talking about stuff. You go, y'all, what are you doing? Anyway, but a lot of times I'd work by myself in these houses and those closets became my prayer closets because you had to spend an exorbitant amount of those closets taping them out and mudding them just for a closet. And I remember sitting there so many times and God just speaking to me in those closets. And I miss that because it was like when you've done sheetrock all the years I did it, it was just like mind numbing. It wasn't, you didn't have to think. So your mind was free to go wherever you wanted to go. You just had to go through the routine of doing the sheetrock. I don't, I don't, I miss that to a certain extent. That's why I like getting out doing the construction and stuff because it's like mind numbing. I think some on it, but I, it just kind of gets you out thinking differently. Don't take the mundane as just the mundane. God can use a donkey search to put you in the right spot to get a word from God. Be listening because God is always speaking. Whether we can hear it or not, God's always speaking. Do you need a word from the Lord? Sometimes he will intervene and he'll send somebody. My hesitancy during that prophetic movement was everybody was going looking for a word from God when God was already speaking. Now, the prophet in the New Testament, I think, needs to confirm what God is already speaking in your heart. If you're looking for direction, God's giving you a lot of direction and words. Now, there are times that God speaks. I know I talked to Jackie many times about this because she, she likes that prophetic gift that God has put in me. As a pastor, it's tough. I know too much, you know. And, and sometimes I have to go because I want to give somebody a word. And I'm going, am I giving this word because I know this or am I giving this word because God's told me this? That's a struggle because there are times, but I can go do a revival in a place where I know nobody. And, and, I, and I've been in those situations. And I, I can read somebody's mail sitting on the front row, second row, third row. I can tell you, boom, 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 boom. I know nothing of them. And I tell the pastor, don't tell me anything about anybody here. You know, don't tell me that Susie's sleeping with so-and-so. and that. Don't tell me of this stuff. I don't need to know. I just, let me just be me. It's a lot easier. I remember going down to that, um, it was a black church down in Columbus, Mississippi. No, Columbus, Georgia. I have no idea. I can't even remember how I got in touch with them. They invited me to come down. It's the first time I ate goat. And they were from Africa and stuff. And, I mean, they, they brought me in as apostle, you know, kind of thing. And I went down. And the Lord just really started giving me words to everybody in that place, you know. And, and I'm like, and, and in the black church, it's just different. And so when I, I, and so we put the goat on that night, and it was good somewhat. It was kind of chewy. Um, I tried to eat what was before me, and, and it was just a, but it was interesting. And then when you get through, like here at the pastor, I'm turning off lights and turning up the heat and air. That was driving them crazy, you know, because <laughs> like, I was like, we can't get out of here until all this is off, right? No, no, yo, man of God, don't need to be doing this. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but it, it, we got to get it turned off. And then, no, 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 man of God, no. But I remember the Lord, because I didn't know anybody there, but the Lord just anointed that moment. It's different as a pastor. It's different as when you're traveling somewhere. So it's just a lot different. Don't take the mundane as just mundane. If God wants to get a word to you, understand he can speak to you. Um, and even, let's just say this, it's kind of humorous. Because I, I even have to take it, even if a cop pulls you over, I look at it as God intervening. You know, I can get mad and say, 
most of the time it's my idiocy of speeding. But I have to look at it and say, all right, I have, I've had many times where it's like slow down and there'll be a cop right on the corner. I don't know how many times I've done that. But, but then that time when it's not, I go, okay, maybe there was something that God was directing around the corner for me. You know, protection, those kind of things. And I had to look at it in those ways. So the mundane, God speaks. He can use a lot of things. Be looking for God in the midst of the mundane and be looking for God to speak to us. And then it can come in times that, and it may even come from places just totally, you think that's just crazy. You may just listen to something and you'll, you'll change the radio station and all of a sudden somebody will pop up something and it'll speak to your spirit. You know, not necessarily Garth Brooks, but, you know, I mean, if you're searching some, it can be Garth Brooks, I don't know, but it, it, you can have that moment where God speaks something to your spirit and it's a word that it kind of delivers in that moment. Uh, he can do those things. So even as he directed all this, I want you to see the supernatural move in this and then um, do not despise what God has done. If he has called you, he will equip you. Yeah. How many of us try to talk God out of whatever he's called us to do? I don't know if y'all ever have, but I do. I mean, I, I used to clamor, clamor to anytime I get a chance to preach somewhere. I don't do as much. I enjoy being with you guys. I mean, I used to, you just couldn't. Somebody say, go preach. Uh, yeah, baby. You know, now I don't know if anybody you know, got anything worth saying, you know. But when I was 20 something years old, I thought I had everything need to be said. And uh, yeah, everybody laughed at me like that too. Uh, and I didn't know it. But I found that we think a lot less of ourselves than what God views us. Saul had a really low opinion of himself, which I think showed up later. He never really got escaped from that. Um, it really didn't. It came out like a storm a little bit later. Remember old, just this fella, he'd love to be pulled up on the internet watching this one day. Um, Stuart Dyer. He loved at college. He got a hold of the phrase, God doesn't care about your ability, he wants your availability. He loved that phrase. And he'd always say that. And we'd all go into the ministry together. Yeah, I don't care about your ability. He care. He wants your availability. And which is true. But then somewhere he's got to shore up our abilities too in the midst of all that because it only carries so far. But I mean, he does give us and equip us. He does equip. Saul was a changed person. I believe the beginning of change in him when he got there prophesying. Was it the end result? You'll find no. I mean, it's just a few chapters over, and you're going to find his demise starts. It's an interesting case study. If you're a psychologist looking at it, you can kind of look at it and go, I don't know if he ever believed fully what God was doing. And that's why I would tell folks, if young people or even older people, when God's called you to do something, you've got to trust he can equip you to do it. Or you're going to be arguing the rest of your days with a gorilla conviction on your back saying, I can't. I do what? <laughs> Sitting at a bar. The best, I mean, a guy that we were downtown doing something. I don't know what we were doing. Well, I know one time we were downtown and we were, I want to say it was March for Jesus, maybe. And we we're getting ready for it. And this guy walks up to me on the streets down there and he knows I know I was a preacher. And he was a little bit inebriated, inebriated. But he started preaching to me. He was good. He was really good. He told me about the call in his life. But he was really good. I mean, I, I couldn't hold a candle to him. He was really good at it. But he told me, he says, I've, I've missed it. He said, I know God's calling me, but I've missed it. And it was a sad conversation. Um, because, and, and I think his lost donkeys were there in that moment because I was able to talk to him. 
and try to encourage him to come back. Whereas he was just wandering the towns in downtown Birmingham. So when we think, well, I've just got to go up here to Walmart and grab something. Or I've got to go back and do this. Understand, God can direct. Um, he can direct. And take it. I know there are times that I, when I get the calls from nine, I mean, I can tell you, these things go off three or four or five times a day, sometimes way before we get up. Uh, you'll see the 9-11 call out. And a lot of times I'll read whatever the headline is and see what it is. I don't go to all of them. I look at it. If somebody's just falling, they got to pick them up, you know, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, there's a place over on Valleydale where it's a, it's a counseling center. And there's a lot of things go out from there. But there are times when I pick it up and I'll go, I got to go. You know, no reason other than just got to go. Don't even know why. It's just got to go. And sometimes it's a suicide attempt or to be a lost child or something like that, I'll go. Because I want to do what I can to help. But that's the God's call, you know. And it's going out to every one of us. Our alarms of our spirit goes off. And we can go, I don't know if I go or not. Trust God. Make yourself available. He will equip you. We were trained in our chaplain's program on doing last rites. Every chaplain's academy, we have that where we do emergency last rites. And uh, that one day when it was Sergeant Moore at the time, he says, Brother Donnie, you know anybody can do last rites? We have a Catholic fellow that's dead out here in Donovan, and the family's asking for a Catholic priest. And I said, well, we've been trained in how to do emergency last rites. He said, you'll do, because they couldn't find a Catholic priest. And the family really wanted a Catholic priest. And I was like, sure. So I'm praying all the way out there. And there, understand this, when somebody's dead, there's no double indemnity to go to hell. It doesn't work that way. I can't do anything to seal their fate one way or the other. And my, in my Protestant belief. So I'm not in danger of harming in any way. But to bring the family comfort, all it is is a, a prayer. And, uh, but I, I do it very what I can do in the far as the Catholic part. And, uh, and so I did that. I prayed all the way out there. I said, God, just, I, I'm making myself available, but I don't feel qualified whatsoever because I don't want to do anything to shock this family because they've already had the death of a loved one. He fell off a roof. They had the death of a loved one. And I was like, I don't want to do anything to harm this situation. And I mean, I'm praying hard on the way out there. And I had it in my mind. I said, God, I'm, I'm going to, Go into the cut and ask a lot of questions. At that time, now I ask questions before I go. I said, I'll go pray for him back in the room where he died. And I'll just have, because we could ask everybody to leave. I can do that. And da, 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 da. Well, he fell off a roof outside. Didn't work. I had it all worked out in my mind how this was going to work because I wasn't sure of myself. And so I had my script, knelt down. His hands were tucked under me, his face down. I couldn't roll him over because I was supposed to anoint his head or his hand. That was under him. His head's face down. Did the best I could. And I prayed and I recited the Catholic prayer. And uh, did what I, parts I, because we do what we're comfortable with in our Protestant tradition. And so when I got through, I stood up and, and we can make the sign of the cross with just a blessing. That's all it is. And uh, it's not exquisite to Catholics only. And uh, so I did that, and I walked back out of the crime scene tape, and the family says, thank you, Father. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know which way I went, but I just bless you. And, uh, and uh, to this day, they thought the Catholic priest showed up, so I don't know. And then, <laughs> do what? I didn't have a call. I have just my chaplain stuff on. Yeah. Oh, it's it's interesting part of the ministry, and then you have. I did not feel, and that's I'll be honest with you. I felt totally inadequate and everything else. But then when I got through there, there was another death up here 
the same house from India gone to about a month before the lady had died. She was Catholic. Father Ray was able to get to that one. So he goes, I'm there. He goes, I was with Jamie Moore over here, and I said, hey, another death. And I said, oh, yeah, you want to go with me? Come on, we might need you. So I go, a Catholic family, and Father Ray came and did. I said, I told Jamie, I said, man, you saw the real McCoy now. And he looked at me and said, I liked yours better. <laughs> I said, you got a novice on my side. But I said, Father Ray, I love Father Ray when he was over here. He's a good guy. Um, but there's, God wants our, bill, our availability. He will equip us if we're willing to go. Saul found that out. Prophetic, yeah. There are songs can minister to you too. I don't know if y'all ever read a song to minister to you. Uh, that was that, what was her name, Janie, Janie? Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, she had a song about the wings of healing, uh, wing, um, broken wings. Oh, gosh, that thing just, I just wept with that song. I mean, it just spoke to my spirit. And uh, so God can use things that you go, wow, how is that going to work? Um, he'll use it. All right, we'll quit. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Help us to understand, to be in your prophetic, your anointing changes us. And, uh, and you truly have a plan for us. So in our mundane, the looking for donkeys, you want to speak to us. And uh, you can even change direction of our life in the midst of the mundane. And I pray that you'll do so. I pray that you'll speak to us and let us be encouraged with your word to our hearts, let your word of God be placed in our hearts so that we can learn from it. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Signing off from Facebook land.